Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I am Liz Benichel. I'm Ulrich Brussel. This week, we have writer-director Natalie Erica James on the show to talk about the making of her first feature, Relic, which had VOD on July 10th that has been in drive-ins across America since July 3rd. Having this feeling of like, oh my God, I've fooled everyone. <laughs> like for, for a solid week of the film, I was like, oh, this is like really happening. And, and somehow I've convinced everyone that I'm capable of doing this. So Natalie talks to us about how she rose from film school grad, making short films and crewing up just to get by, to directing an internationally released horror film that premiered at Sundance earlier this year. But before we get to Natalie... Listen to me. Television is not the truth. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. This week we have an article that really, like, kind of spoke to me in a, a kind of a personal way. Like, I, uh, this isn't something that I just researched for the show. This is something I saw on one of my friends' uh, Facebook pages, and I read the article just by myself, and then um, I really responded to it, and I posted it on my own Facebook, and it kind of spawned a few conversations with some friends of mine, previous guests, and just people in, in my network, and um, yeah, it was really interesting. So basically, the article's um, from this guy whose name I don't remember. I think it's Zach Arnold is his name, and it's all about how Hollywood and filmmaking in general has some huge systematic problems uh, that have been going on, like, since the beginning of filmmaking and all about working conditions, basically. So it's like, you know, basically in film, there's an understanding of this 60 hour work week where you're expected to work like that many hours. It's not a 40 hour work week. Like everybody else gets at 60. You're expected to like sign waivers when you get jobs, like to like waive certain rights in order to like, you know, allow the production company to make the movie. Um, sometimes it's insurance related. Uh, sometimes it's, there's other things that you're waving. Um, it just kind of depends. And like big companies do this all the time. Like when you work, like I've worked for big companies before, you'll get like an NDA and a waiver and a contract and a thing. And you just expect it to sign all these things. And they're like, you know, they're pages, pages long. And like, you know, God knows what you're giving up by signing those things, basically. And then there's also pre like a, a thing that happens a lot where you're pressured to waive your OT on time cards, you know, if you're on a production of commercials and independent film, which it's like, I've been in a situation where I've been pressured to do it. I've been in a situation where I've just been told this is how we do it. So just do it, you know? And then I've also been in situations where it's like, yeah, you know, you're going to get all your OT, but um, don't fill out your time card. I'm going to film out your time card for you, but don't worry. You're going to get your money on your check. So they're obviously filling out the time cards in a certain way to save them money, but they're also getting you paid. So it's all this like complicated shit. And basically, you know, and that's not even all of it, but like, and you, do you want to list some of these other things, Liz, like of like what they're talking about in this article? <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking about, um, in general, there's been a lot of articles right now that say that this is a time to reevaluate, like the fact that we're able to take a step back and see how this industry has been abusive. We all know it's been abusive for years, but this is a chance for us to actually take a pause and change it. So, I mean, what resonated with me was the, I mean, always resonates with me is the suggestion of the work-life balance and how important that is, but how it's impossible when you work in production. Um, and then the idea of like having a family and working in production um, and how that is just an impossible task, really. And also I was thinking about there's this documentary directed by Haskell Wexler a few years ago about the importance of sleep and how there's so many film productions that just like rob people of sleep. And this also spoke to that, just the idea of like driving the boxcar truck through traffic after like two hours of sleep and being paid nothing for it. And then, you know, not getting health insurance. I mean, all of these elements um, that pervade this industry are, are really... <laughs> Yeah. are horrible but yeah. it's like we do it because it's like oh it's really competitive and there's someone right behind you to take that job if you decide to leave or if you say no 
Right. And then I think in the, the guys for like, especially narrative film, like it's like what you want to do. And it's like this really important thing that you've been working towards for so long. So it's like, you don't want to like one of the phrases they use a lot in the articles, like don't want to rattle the cages or yeah. be difficult by like complaining about these standards that we should all be getting basically. Um, so like half the article is like listing all the issues. And then, you know, they also have a ton of examples of people from Facebook and, like emails and other things like kind of talking about their unique problems they've had and like examples of these issues. Um, and at the very end, he kind of gets to like what we should do about it. I don't know, man, it's kind of a tough, tough uh, solution because he's basically saying like, yeah, when you get back um, from COVID and you're like offered a job and if it's not like meeting the standards that you should be getting, if you're not, if you're getting offered a lesser rate or if you're not getting all the different things that you should be getting for what you're doing, like whether it's uh, paid overtime or whether it's, you know, proper healthcare, what, whatever it is, you like, you should stand your ground and not take the job. But like, honestly, like crew people who haven't been working for three months, like, can they actually afford not to take a job? Like if they get offered a feature right now, like, are they really not going to take it? If it's like, oh, your day rate's like $50 less than it normally is or $100 less than it normally is. Like, are you really going to not take it? And then, I mean, and it also speaks to a bigger thing, which is like face us, faces us as independent filmmakers. It's like, we don't have normal rates to give people on indie films. Like, our indie films have to be under rate in order for them to exist. And that's just sort of like an understood thing among film crews is that indie films, like we're not able to pay the full union day rates on, on these movies just because it doesn't exist for us. Like, like we could, the movie wouldn't be able to be made if we had to, you know? And so what does that mean? Like, does that mean that like we shouldn't have indie films exist because we can't pay union standards? Like, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think, Liz? Well, there was a similar argument when I was talking with friends, I think years ago about film festivals. And it was like, film festivals do not pay their staff well at all. And they, those staffers work, like they screen for free. They work for free for like 18 to 20 hours every day during the festival. They get taken advantage of. And like the argument to that is like, oh, well, we should just get rid of those film festivals and we should just like reduce those opportunities because abuse is pervasive through those because like the infrastructure is just not solid enough to uh, compensate people properly. But then the other side of the coin is like, how are people going to get experience? How can they build up bulk on their resume? How are they going to network? So, I mean, it's voluntary. When I make a feature and I've made you know, two features for very low amounts of money, I have a conversation with every single crew member and I say like, look, please only do this if you can afford to do this. And like, we're going to make it as easy as possible on you in terms of like, we won't go in overtime. You know, there's, we're very communicative. We're very kind. We're available to you at all times. But like, if you can't financially afford to do this, please say no, please say no. And like, we'll find other ways to connect and work on things together. And I think there needs to be a lot more transparency and kindness from the producers um, because I think a lot of people at the beginning take these jobs without even knowing that this is uh, a major part of a culture of abuse. Right. They just think this is a one-time bad job. They don't realize that it's incredibly prevalent. Yeah, I, I do think that a lot of it is the way that you approach it. Like I think the way you ask and the way you present the job is key into whether I feel comfortable with it or not. And like, I do the same thing that you do with all my, my yeah. projects with my feature and with like, well, actually the two features I, that I've produced now. And then like all the short films, it's always like presenting it as like, this is the situation. This is what we're doing. Are you willing to do this? And I know that I want to pay you more. I know I want to give you more things, but we just can't. And this is what, what we have for this project you know, um, are you into the film? Do you want to join this this little film family for whatever, 12 days, 15 days, whatever it is. And, and that's sort of the way that you present it. And then you treat everybody with respect and you try to provide the things that they are used to the best you can, like with food and with giving breaks and giving time, you know, uh, to each department to do the things that they need to do. And then, yeah, not going over. And then if we do do, we do go over, like we, we went over a little bit um, on the alternate. I know I make it sound like we went over a lot on my, on my logs, but it wasn't that bad. But we did pay overtime every time we did go over. 
And, um, you know, people were respectful of that and, and, they, and they liked the way that we handled it, you know, and I think it was just because there was so much love behind everything we were doing with that movie and a lot of respect for the crew, which, you know, I'm really happy that, like, that's what I was trying to do. And then what I hear back from people is that that's how it was. So mm-hmm. it feels good, but, you know, but still like a lot of the things that, you know, they're talking about this article, like I have done before, not in the way that they talk about it in the article, but like. You know, I have, you know, asked people to wave overtime. I've, I've asked for grace all, a lot, you know. Um, and, you know, it's never a you have to or a pressure. It's always a respectful ask. And we usually do it like well ahead of time if we know that that's the case, you know. So it's not like a, we don't we don't do it like on set like and and because that's like even if you ask them on set there is a pressure there you know oh, right yeah just so, going around and yeah in front of yeah, everyone yeah. yeah exactly and calling it out in a big way so it's usually it's always tried to be done as privately and respectfully as possible so i don't know i mean i'm, I'm sure i can do better as well in those things but like my, my final point on this is like i don't think it's the crew that's going to change this i think it's going to be the 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 production the companies and the producers and i mean as a producer i'm one of these people who can make this change but it's like at the end of the day like do you say oh well um you know this is the budget that we have it's not enough to make the movie that you want to make sorry uh you know we're not going to do it you know like is that really something that i want to say as a burgeoning producer who's trying to you know make a name for myself and like you know get credits under my belt and get more experience you know, so it's, it's kind of hard. Um, but I do think that we all have to be hold, held accountable and that it's, it's up to the producers, the production companies. And the higher up the chain you go, those people are going to be the ones to affect change the most, I think. Like if Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers, those companies are starting to like make these changes, I think the trickle down effect will happen better. Yeah, I mean, there's always that story of um, Won't You Be My Neighbor and Marielle Heller and like their European, their French hours that they worked, right? But it did make me think, um, I know we're winding up, but it did make me think, um, uh, I felt very appreciative to my producers because I feel like every project I was a part of, I'm always like, let's go, let's go. Can we do it? Can we do it as a time? Can we set our dates? Can we go? And I've always had producers who were like, slow down, Liz. We don't have enough money to even like bare bones treat people in a like halfway decent way. (laughs) And I do think like it's a moment of reflection and reevaluation right now. Like just like it is like people are evaluating their daily commute by working remotely. Like think of all the smog we're reducing and all the traffic we're reducing. Like we can actually do something right now. We can pivot and that's very exciting. So I can, I have my Ulrich optimism instilled in me that like we may be able to uh, force change because we've all tasted what the other side is like right now. <laughs> breath catches in my chest as I hear three little words. You got mail. This week we have a question from listener Mark Klein. Mark writes, so I've been entering scripts screenplay contests and I came across a contest that had the following requirements. Feature length screenplays must be between 85 to 130 pages in length and written in standard screenplay format and 12 point courier font, simple front and back cover with page, pages numbered. All this is pretty standard except for the mention of a back cover. Back cover? What's that? Is it a blank page? Is it the last page of a script? Is it something else? This is the first time I've seen uh, this. So I'm starting, so I started looking into what's a, what a back cover is. A few Google searches left me with more questions than answers. The results are spotty at best. Some sites talk about the actual physical back cover as being blank, 60-pound cardstock that matches the cover with a, with a title, which would make sense if the script was going to be printed off. But this is for a digital submission, so that's not the back cover I'm looking for. Other sites do make mention of the back cover is the last page of the script that contains the ending transition, fade to black, cut to black, etc. So to the best of my knowledge, I say the back cover is a blank page unless proven otherwise. So Mark Klein is my friend and I think he's very cool. And he sent me this question and I thought, I know the perfect person to answer this. It's Nate Ruger. Nate Ruger, and you know Nate Ruger, is like yeah. writer extraordinary. He's written like 5 million screenplays. He's a writer, director. He's Oh, wonderful human. I just want to talk about how great Nate Ruger is. Um, and so we did. We sent this question to Nate Ruger, and here is his response. Hi, Mark. Uh, this is uh, Nate Ruger, and I'm uh, happy to do my best to try and answer your question about 
uh, what you've encountered on certain screenplay competitions asking for a back cover to your script. So, from my experience uh, working at Red Wagon Productions on the Sony lot, back covers were only something that would appear at on a physical hard copy. So, to be honest, I think you've done your homework, and uh, this is not something you should be worried about for a digital submission. It seems like it was something that may have been copied and pasted or just taken from memory uh, from back from the uh, early aughts to um, much earlier than that, back when screenplays had physical archives for every script and every draft that was uh, went through a development company or went through a screenplay contest. Uh, so my job as an intern at Red Wagon Productions on the Sony lot, uh, as an intern, one of many uh, little tasks was to manage or take a look at, or make sure that the script archive was in good working condition and gosh i feel old so what those scripts look like is very much like printing out your own screenplay except if you're trying to keep track of dozens hundreds of them uh you had to print it out make sure it was on a uh, three hole punched uh you would press it down really hard and you actually write on the spine of those hundred or so pages uh the title of the script and maybe even the author's uh last name uh in sharpie and then you would have those 60 pound cardstock pieces that also had three hole punches, and you'd put uh, little brads on the top and bottom. And those cardstock was there to protect the other script's last pages or uh, from the other little bits of uh, brads that were sticking out and poking into them, just so that your screenplay wouldn't slowly over time get torn apart by these little, uh, you know, sticky brass ends needling into the, the front or back page from the other scripts that were getting shoved inside it. So it's really just to uh, protect the back end of your script from getting torn apart by other brands if you had a physical hard drive copy, which you don't. So long uh, story short, you're sending a digital submission, just end your script with fade to black, smash to black, or, or just even the end if you want, and you don't have to worry about having an extra page after that since it's just going to be a PDF. So uh, don't worry about back cover when you see it, unless you are sending a physical copy, and if you're sending a physical copy, I honestly don't know if I would deal with that competition that demands a physical copy in this day and age. Hope that helps, and uh, good luck with your submission. Thanks, Nate. I mean, I think that pretty much sums it up, right? So uh, I did not know the answer to this question at all, and I'm really glad that Nate did, and now we all know, and we're all better for it. Uh, I also want to shout out to Nate, because he was a supporter of the alternate, Thank you, Nate. You are my hero and just a really, really uh, sweet guy. And uh, I think he was one of the people who wanted to have his photo be added to Alien, which like everyone who wanted to be added to Alien and not be just put in the portal was like, or, or another movie like that, like Terminator or something. Those people are my, I just, they're my kindred spirits because that's, if I was, you know, in like, contributing to my own campaign, that's what I would have wanted to be put into Alien or Terminator or one of these awesome movies. So amazing. And if you want to be like Mark Klein and ask us a question, you can, or make us comment or just a suggestion, you can send us an email to podcast at mickeymoviesheart.com. Um, or if you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or any other places you can leave a review for, for podcasts. And we also have a Patreon page. So if you really love the show and you want to support us, go over to www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. Give us a dollar, five dollars, nine dollars, whatever you want. And then if you do give us nine bucks, you'll get a brand new enamel pin, which we still have many of. So, uh, <laughs> you know, grab a pin, be fun. And you can only, you don't have to do it for a month. You just do it for a month and then you're go to the dollar or zero dollars and then you're done. What about truth? What about the reality? What about the way the old ending tested in Canoga Park? So the past few weeks, we've been asking uh, women in independent storytelling why they got into this business to begin with. And I got a little bored. I mean, like, I like to hear origin stories, but I wanted to switch it up a little bit. So this week, we're asking about whether people felt like they were an imposter on or offset and how did they combat those feelings and how do they solve that, that problem. Uh, so enjoy. <music> Hi, my name is Cassandra Chowdhury, and I'm an independent producer who also happens to do a lot of animation. I actually learned to do stop motion animation out of necessity. I was producing a micro budget music video and our animator just kind of disappeared. We couldn't get a hold of him. 
Uh, but we didn't want to scrap the idea of, for the project, so I just did some research and I learned how to animate so that I could complete the project. The whole thing was a learning process, of course, and I made a lot of mistakes, but the results were great. Uh, it's one of the best things that I think I've made, and it got me a lot of animation work on other projects. Even so, I still had trouble saying I was an animator. Like, sure, I had been paid to animate, but I wasn't an amazing artist, and I hadn't gone to school for animation, and I didn't have the fancy equipment that a real stop-motion studio would have. So it took years of me animating and seeing my animation play in festivals and on television for me to finally feel comfortable calling myself an animator. And I realized there was no right way to do animation. Just like with so many other disciplines in our industry, you don't have to have the highest quality equipment or the largest crews or the most impressive schooling to do something well. You do what you can with what you have and you get the job done. And that's what I did. My name is Amy Oden. Um, I am a producer at Maryland Public Television and an independent documentary producer, director, DP, and editor. A moment on set where I felt like an imposter was when I was early in my career and I had a prolonged argument with a seasoned engineer at the station I was working at about whether um, tripod plates should be stored with tripods or with cameras because I had just been promoted to managing a variety of equipment. Um, I eventually won out um, and the tripod plates were stored with the tripods, Um, but it was just a really difficult series of conversations where I felt like I had to prove that I was competent. That's probably the biggest single illustration, but I will say that I felt like an imposter anytime anything breaks on set or a battery dies or a card fills up or a light bulb blows. And I think over the years, I've just learned to practice self-soothing techniques when I need to troubleshoot something. So whenever something goes wrong, if I can sort of de-escalate that rising sense of panic within myself, um, then I'm kind of faking it till I make it and nobody has to know that something is terribly wrong. Um, And as long as the talent feels like I'm doing a professional job, then I am. Natalie, we start off with our our first five questions that all Rick alluded to. So question one is, how many days did you shoot Relic? Uh, It was 30 days. Ooh. Yeah. 10 hour days though, sorry. Oh, 10 hours. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we're in Australia. So yeah, it's just the 10 hour. So what was your rough budget for the film? Um, I think it was around four to five US, something like that. How long did you work on the film from inception to release? Uh, I started writing it end of 2014 and it's being released uh, in two weeks. So yeah, roughly five years, I would say, five to six years. And then how big was your crew? On our biggest day, we probably had about a hundred people on set, but that was like our big stunt, you know, whatever production day. I think in general, it was probably closer to like 30, something like that. And out of all your projects, how difficult was this one? Do you know what? I would say the short that I made in China off my own back with a crew of like seven people was probably harder in terms of like from an emotional level. (laughs) Because at least with this film, you know, there's a lot of pressure. It was really challenging, but I had a really great support team. Whereas that was just like making a film out in you know, a void, it felt like. So that was probably the hardest thing I've done, the short. I want to hear about the short. Can we just ask what was that short was about really quickly? Oh, so that was a short I made in my honors year at film school uh, in 2013. And I, yeah, just, I just really, because I had grown up in China and finished high school there. I had this story um, about a university student kind of grappling with, I guess, the pressures of, you know, the expectations his his family had placed on him for his career ahead. And it kind of all centered around his first time and the performance anxiety he 
experience in his first time. Um, and yeah, I just kind of took a, a group of six Aussies, or maybe five Aussies over, and we made this short, you know, off the smell of an oily rag. It was really, really low budget. It was, um, it's really hard to make a short film in China back then, uh, especially if you don't have money, <laughs> because uh, it's hard to lock things in. Um, and so it felt like it was just kind of all in chaos up until probably like five days leading up to it, things were finally slotting into place. So it was just this kind of, yeah, crazy thing that I, I decided to embark on. And uh, I'm really glad I did because I learned so much from it. Um, but yeah, the most mentally challenging shoot of my life. <laughs> I came back feeling like I could do anything essentially. So, <laughs> nice. so Relic was hard, but it was it was never impossible like that shoot felt like. <laughs> and and is that movie done and out online for people to see? Can we share it with our listeners? Oh, uh, it's called Burrow. It's I never released it online because now I feel like it was doing some festivals and then I felt like it was so far like too far in my past that it's quite uh. embarrassing to like release now <laughs> um even though the actors were brilliant and they did such an amazing job uh maybe someday <laughs> someday okay so i'm really curious like coming off of you know making a short like that and then you said that you started uh writing relic in 2014 like what was the inspiration for the film and why did you decide to write this horror movie yeah, I, I guess the inspiration came from a really personal place. Um, my grandmother suffered from Alzheimer's. So um, I, in 2014, I took a trip to go see her and it was the first time she couldn't remember who I was. And so that had a really big, that hit me pretty hard, um, I feel. And she lived in this like uh, older Japanese house that I'd always been terrified of as a kid. So I think those two things kind of came together. And because I was always interested in the horror genre and I'd already made a few kind of horror shorts. Um, it just felt like a natural fit and a good way to tell the story. I understand that Australia has a very different system compared to the US in terms of funding, mm -hmm. distribution, production services. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about putting the project together, specifically the financing? Yeah, so there was a version of this film that maybe could have just been made in Australia. We have a, a government funding body and a state funding body, so Screen Australia and Film Victoria, which is the state I live in. And um, they had kind of supported us through development. So they basically gives you rounds of money to complete your drafts. Um, and I had some Aussie producers on board as well. And they had a history of pairing up with, I guess, international partners, whether they're producing partners or financiers or sales agents or whatever it was. So I guess they already had like quite an international mindset. But when I made um, Creswick, which is Relic's proof of concept, uh, it played at a few festivals and um, it allowed me to get representation in the US and so my reps were really great at kind of hooking us up with potential US producing partners. Um, and so, yeah, we just met with a bunch of people and talked through, you know, the vision for the, the film and um, just trying to see who was a good fit. And I think that was when Nine Stories came on board as just producing partners. And then Agbo, uh, after we did a couple drafts of Nine Stories, came on board as uh, financiers. So they co-financed with Australia. And roughly when was that in the timeline? Was it like 2018, 2017 or earlier than that? Oh, you're testing me now. Um, <laughs> so we shot, we shot end of 2018 or like mid to late. So I would say the financing came together early 2018 and that's when Agro oh, wow. would have jumped on. And then 2017 would have been nine stories, maybe mid to late 2017. So the short film that you made, Cresswick, if I'm saying that correctly, um, yeah. did that come like out of a, a need to prove yourself in order to get the film made? Like, had you already like written the drafts of the feature and tried to sell it and then like no luck? And then they're like, okay, I'll make this short to prove people that this movie deserves to exist. Yeah, it was part of a few things. I, um, I think also in general, you learn so much with every film that you make and I genuinely wanted to just make it um, for myself uh, and to I guess uh, I guess you could call it practice you know to like hone the craft or just you know try stuff that I thought would work 
Um, but from a very practical sense, yeah, exactly. You know, I think people have been uh, using proof of concept successfully for years um, when Creswick was made. So it felt like a smart, you know, decision. We already had the first draft of Relic uh, when we made the short and it, we, we didn't try and squash the whole feature into 10 minutes. We just came up with a shorter story and different characters that kind of summed up the feature more succinctly. So um, it's quite similar, but uh, yeah, it just, it doesn't have the same setup or characters or anything like that. Did you share that when you were casting or did actors or uh, potential collaborators ask to see it or were you trying to protect them from seeing it because it may influence vision for relic no they i think they definitely watched it yeah i'm pretty sure i i pretty distinctly recall bella heathcote asking me about the creature at the end of it um <laughs> so yeah i think it i think it certainly helps and particularly for a first-time director i think it can be a hard sell for actors sometimes because there's such a risk involved um so yeah, it helps to be able to kind of show something that's tonally, um, visually similar. I want to hear about how you connect. I, I'm like, I'm stealing the spotlight from Ulrich. Sorry, Ulrich. Um, <laughs> I want to hear a little bit about how you got connected to the Russo brothers, Drake Gyllenhaal. Like, how did you build this amazing team? It seems like it got... I mean, I know this is a span of several years, but honestly, it seems like a dream scenario. Like you make this short, you get waves, you get mm. representation, you you build this foundation, you build this house. Can you help educate us on, on how all these things came together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess um, <laughs> I guess when you put it like that, it, it feels very smooth. And <laughs> for me as well, you know, it, I think it, when you're in the process of it, it, it feels like, a lot of hard work in the writing. And I, I also have this thing about always like expecting the worst, but you know, hoping for the best. So at every every turn I was like, oh, this is gonna fall through. Like, no, no worries, like whatever, I'll just keep going. Um, <laughs> and yeah, in some ways, like it's kind of looking back, it's, it's just like a surreal miracle that it all panned out. Cause so much can fall apart, right? Like the, any, at any point could the casting have fallen through or, you know, the, the Screen Australia funding is only for a certain time. So if you don't like get it greenlit in other ways, it kind of falls through as well. So um, we had to change our shoot dates like six different times or something, you know, like crazy kind of stuff. So um, it's, I agree. It's kind of an amazing miracle that it even <laughs> exists. <laughs> um, but in terms of hooking up with uh, the partners, uh, that was mostly through representation because I felt like, yeah, I, I certainly did not have those contacts as a filmmaker in Melbourne. And uh, yeah, they were really great. Uh, we, we worked with like Endeavor content as well. And I'm signed with WME and yeah, my, my agents are um, wonderful and they work with a lot of directors in a similar space. So it felt like a really good fit for me uh, making that decision. Um, and you know, you, you have, I think, I feel like maybe what was great, uh, if I had to point to anything that helped it along was just timing as well, in terms of like people looking for horror and specifically horror by woman. Um, because I think Babadook came out, what, like 2014. So, you know, right. for whatever reason it was, or 2015, um, just a good time in that you know, it was what, it was the type of script that people were looking for. So I, I don't think you can discount luck as well. And yeah, it's funny, like uh, you have all sorts of meetings in LA where a lot of them are just generals, right? Where you're just meeting people like establishing rapport, um, trying to see if you can work on something further down the track. Uh, and I thought the ADVA meeting was a general. So I didn't realize that it was like a potential pitching kind of meeting. <laughs> and that probably helped because I wasn't kind of nervous or anything. I was just kind of like, oh, hey, like, how are you going? This is my film. I'm really passionate about it. This is why I want to tell this story. It's going to be great. Um, and then, yeah, they, they kind of put in an offer really soon after that. So it feels... I don't know, all those things probably helped, but yeah, I, I do feel like timing was a good, it was a big, big factor as well. So was it like your, your short playing at a certain film festival that got you the representation or was it just like the run in general that kind of attract people or can you point to like one specific festival that like kind of gave you that success? 
Yeah, interestingly enough, I can. It was um, Fantasia Film Festival, which is oh, yeah. awesome festival love those guys um and it was eric khan at indiewire who wrote an article which was like top five films to see at fantasia and uh, creswick was one of them and just off the back of that i started getting kind of yeah emails from random people just <laughs> managers agents that kind of thing so yeah it was pretty um it was pretty pivotal i guess and then those agents are the ones that got you your meetings in Los Angeles, which led to your production company signing on, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So it really is like the dream come true story in a lot of ways. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah. well earned I mean, dream come true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so many ups and downs. So, like, keep in mind, I graduated from film school in like 2011. So, by that right. point, I was, you know, five years out of film school and, or however long it was. Yeah. Cause I think 2016 is when. Creswick came out um and you go through such a uh man some tough years post film school I think like film school is enough of a big you know um stress and there's so much expectation that everyone puts on themselves to make this like film that's going to make their career and it's like never the case like I feel like my graduate film probably did like five festivals, six festivals, that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, we had the the true success stories of my year where, or like previous years, I went to VCA in Melbourne and like Ariel Kleiman, for example, had his film go to Cannes out of third year. And, you know, those are the people that you were like, oh fuck, like they're just right out of the gate, like just in it. So I was certainly never that person. It was just like working production jobs for ages, just making your own stuff on the side. I would say like, <laughs> it doesn't have to happen super early, you know. Will you talk a little bit about, you know, superstition, thinking things are gonna fall through or, you know, the mm. six years or five years that were difficult. Do you ever feel on set directing Emily Mortimer? You know, like, did you ever doubt yourself? Were you ever intimidated by the experience? Did you ever feel imposter syndrome? Can you talk a little bit about oh, um, yeah. the task at hand when you go <laughs> to set for the first time? Yeah, it's almost like your brain is split into two, I feel. Like one part of you is uh, like, this is just a completely surreal experience. Um, exactly what you've said about um, feeling like an imposter. Like I, I was, <laughs> I remember really distinctly driving home or my you know, partner driving me home from set and just kind of having this feeling of like, oh my God, I've fooled everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like for, for a solid week of the film I was like oh this is like really happening and and somehow I've convinced everyone that I'm capable of doing this and then the other side of you is kind of just I guess in a sense like kicking into kicking into gear with like everything you've prepared for the last you know decade of your life and so it feels really natural and fun and you're not always like uh, paralyzed by self-doubt or anything but you certainly have moments where you're like hang on is this is this for real? And uh, when I made the film, I was still like living in a, a share house and, you know, drove like a bomb of a car and was somehow having to like drive into like our production set. Cause I was like 28 when we started filming it two years ago. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was certainly like just surreal to have to go back to like my share house, even though I love my housemate, I loved my housemates. And yeah, it's like living two lives in a way. But I think, I think that's the thing. Like if you think too much about like the long-term implications or the expectations, like you're inevitably gonna, gonna freak yourself out and you just have to kind of focus on the task uh, in front of you. And it is that whole thing of like scene by scene, I suppose. And if it's something you've been doing for a while, then it's not too dissimilar. Like you can't be tripped up by the, you know, the profile of the factors that you're working with. Can you talk about the first week of production on Relic? Like, was there any like, you know, really t like tough moments? Like, did you go over on any of your days that first week? Were there any like things you learned right away that you were able to take on to the rest of the shoot? Like any stories like that? We we had a few kind of hiccups with um, some crew in that first week, which I can't really talk about in depth, mm. but um, that was certainly challenging because it felt, it's there's just so much uncertainty going into that first week already that you're kind of like 
uh, I just, I, I don't know if it's me or if it's just circumstance. So kind of pushing through that was, was really important. We, we definitely had some locations fall through in pre-production and we were like 40% over budget on the, um, some of the set designs. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to cut everything down and that caused all sorts of issues of course because then you're suddenly having to like uh you know um do a lot of creative problem solving to make it feel the space feel bigger than it is so all those sorts of normal stresses i would say yeah i can't think of any massive massive hiccups but let me get back to you uh no, no no worries sounds like you had <laughs> you, you handled it well is what it sounds like um which is good oh yeah, I mean, you certainly have your moments where you go home and you're just like, fuck, <laughs> you just let it all like get to you. But definitely on set, you kind of just have to push through. <laughs> yeah. What about the reception? So you get the dream phone call from a Sundance programmer and they tell you that you made into the festival. I Take actually us- missed it. What? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> which is hilarious. I was traveling in Japan at the time and I was just in, an, I was hiking and just didn't have any reception. And so, oh. yeah, I missed the, the call from the programmer. And Did they I, leave um, a message? Like, how did you? <laughs> they got onto my producers. And so I find, you know, when I finally got reception, I just had like on every single platform, my producer just going, call me right now. Like I thought something terrible had happened. <laughs> Um, but it was amazing. Like my, um, when I finally, uh, spoke to my producer, uh, my partner and I were in this kind of empty cafe in Japan after hiking and I I burst into tears when I got the news and he like pulled out his camera and started taking photos of me to like commemorate the moment and all these waitresses <laughs> all these waitresses were like looking at us really like worriedly like he just broke it up with me and, and then it's documented it <laughs> <laughs> that was great um but yeah so so much joy like it was yeah just i was on another planet was uh locking in distribution for the movie easy after sundance or was it like sundance was the first festival and then you did a bunch of others and then distribution came later well, look, yeah, I'm so glad that we got to squeeze in that screening because, yeah, everything shut down after, you know, yeah. I think it was probably Berlin, but oh, we only went wow. at Sundance. Yeah. Well, so the we disease were... spread at Sundance. There's all these articles yeah, about how it was saw like that. the space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and certainly I remember people being really, not everyone, but my parents came along and they were really conscious about the spread and were wearing masks on the flight home and everything like that. So um they yeah so i guess everything you know we were programmed for south by southwest and um that was cancelled uh distribution i think ifc came on board a few months after sundance like march i would say so it took a little while like it, it definitely wasn't one of those like bidding wars that you hear so much about or anything but um but i'm so happy like with them they've been really great uh and I love how they've been pushing the whole um, the drive-in theater thing as well. Oh, yeah. I get, yeah, yeah. I get a real kick out of that. Yeah. So you probably, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you weren't really involved in the discussions regarding distribution, or did you assert yourself in those spaces? Did your producers allow you, or did you, or I should, that's such a weird way to phrase it. Like, did they allow you? <laughs> um, <laughs> but did, did they open the doors, and were you um, a part of those negotiations? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, not directly in the negotiation element of it, but um, definitely like kept in the loop throughout in a way that, you know, I admittedly don't have that much experience with that side of the industry, but I'm really um, keen to learn all that. So, um, yeah, I I definitely was like across all the emails and all that. Um, But yeah, probably wasn't driving the sale. (laughs) If that's that's what you're (laughs) So what was one of your biggest takeaways from directing Relic? Like after, you know, the 30 days are over and you got into the editing room and you're looking at the footage, like what is one thing that, you know, you'd want to, pe- like if you're to tell like a young filmmaker, like what they should know going into their first feature, like what is that thing? If there is one thing. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a few things. I just assumed that because it was a feature film, there would be enough time in pre-production um, and that every, everything would be 
like kind of taken care of in a way. But really, I think films are such a case by case scenario and each one is different. And so in some ways, it's it's OK to take like more ownership of that and kind of drive how much prep your film would need because producers can only really guess unless you tell them. Um, so that's one element of it, I would say. The other thing would be, um, like conversely, you know, you don't have to have all the answers like immediately. Um, and I think that's, I, I think I, I, I knew this going into it, so I didn't experience it as much, but I know, you know, having talked to a few other first time directors that there's often a sense that you have to prove yourself and that you need to, um, you know, be able to have the answer to everything, but really you can lean on your HODs and, you know, um, what's HOD for you? Oh, sorry. Um, heads of department. Oh, okay. You know, and you've hired them for, for a reason, right? Because they're good at their job and they, you know, it's more about that collaboration. So you certainly have to curate everything that comes is flying at you because obviously great ideas are, can still be wonderful, but still not right for your vision of what the film is. So you have to keep constantly like steering it onto the right path. But at the same time, you don't have to be like an island, you know, in these decisions. Like, I feel like some people can really experience this feeling of the, the sheer pressure of it and kind of freeze up a bit. Whereas it's better to just go, look, I know we need to get here, but I don't know how. Do you have any suggestions? What can we do? Um, and I think that's just a healthier, <laughs> healthier for you, you know, and you don't have to know everything. So I think that's quite valuable. I wanted to jump to the big picture questions. Arik, did you have any last questions? When you got onto the project, were you allowed to bring on your team? Like, were you allowed to select your own cinematographer, production designer, those kinds of people? HODs. Or were they HODs? Or were you like kind of at the mercy of your, uh, of your producers? Or was it like kind of a collaboration? Look, I have to admit there was an element of that in terms of, I guess Australians are really risk adverse in a lot of ways. And so in America, my sense is that they really embrace newcomers and this like idea of fresh blood, maybe. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, like, like <laughs> I feel like it's an easier sell for a hot shot cinematographer who's done like, you know, some cool ads and some cool oh. shorts to get on board oh. a feature film, right? Like that right. is an okay. easier sell. Whereas for Australia, it's like, it, that doesn't matter because he's never done a feature like where are all his like feature credits and our industry is so small in comparison too so really it's like this I mean there's a lot of DPs but like the ones who are making feature films consistently like there's a really small pool so I think there was some pressure to go with people who had those kind of baseline credits which I don't think um is always the best for the project and the director because it's more about the like, I feel like there are so many ta talented, you know, HODs, DOPs out <laughs> there, but it's more about like how well you can communicate with that person and how well they can take what you're trying to do and like interpret that, right? So um, yeah, there was, a, there was definitely a bit of that. So did you have to work with a new director of photography on the film that you hadn't worked with before because of that reason? No, I, I ended up working with my DP on Creswick as well. Oh, great. But That's awesome. It took a lot of wrangling. Oh, oh, oh I see, I see. I see. <laughs> That's great, yeah. though, that you... Yeah. Church yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I have one more question. I'll just ask it. Why not? Um, so I just wanted to hear about your directing style and, um, like how you communicated with actors. Like, did you have a lot of rehearsal or was it kind of like you just arrived on set and you had to go and then... Mm -hmm. Like Liz asks this question sometimes, like, you know, about, oh, do you talk in like metaphors and in like this like flowery way? Are you very direct? Like, what is your style with actors? So I guess in terms of process, I, I hesitate to call it like a, a proper process, but um, I, my, my approach is to uh, have a lot of conversations with the actors in pre-production. And I guess it's not dissimilar to co-writing in a way that, you know, you're really sharing life stories and experiences and trying to find kind of common ground between the two of you as it relates to the characters, what they're going through, their motivations, where they're coming from, all that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of the prep work is done 
prior to being on set or in the lead up to being on set so that when you're on set, you have this kind of shorthand of how you talk about those kinds of stuff. Because, you know, emotions are so subjective and a character's motivation can, you know, mean one thing to one person and another um, to others. So I think it's, it's, it's important to have like a, a foundation on which you're working on. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like, I'm, I'm always wary of over rehearsing, I would say. Um, just because, particularly rehearsing like what physically happens in the film, because I think it, there's a danger of a sense of like trying to recapture something you did in rehearsal. So I'm always like quite wary of that. We did some rehearsals, but most of it was stunt based, which is great because you get to um, have the actors working together. So at least they, they get used to that, but it's not like trying to, you know, nail it in the rehearsal and then you can, you know, do it again in front of the camera. So um, yeah, I think that's generally my approach to it, that most of it is found on the day. I like to do, get a range, I would say. So I, I tend to do bigger number of takes, not massive or anything, but um, a healthy amount, I would say. <laughs> um, I like to, yeah, I like to mix it up a bit. I think, I think in the case of Relic, they were all, all three were really willing to just keep going for it, and definitely there was no pressure to be like, oh, I've I've done it. You know, it was like they were constantly trying to push further, explore more. And in terms of notes, apparently I'm very specific. <laughs> Um, but I, I tend not, to, I try not to like over intellectualize it or like, even if I am in my head, I, I try not to like burden them with that stuff because it's, I don't think it's helpful to like being in the moment. So I tend to focus on, you know, one kind of big picture shift or pivot in the performance that I think could be pushed further. Yeah, apparently, I mean, when we were doing press at Sundance, they they, <laughs> they said I was very demanding, but uh, oh. you, I don't think you can know that about yourself. You know, like I, 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 I never would have said that about myself, but. Last follow up, How what's a healthy number of takes? Are you talking like five, 10? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like five is a good median number. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. cool. There you go, five there you go. Bad. Yeah, that's not bad. Five that was good. like my yeah. average, yeah. Right, right. I, it depends on the scene, right? If it's really meaty, then you might do like 10, but that's that's a pretty big scene. Well, I know we're winding down, but you said something that struck me, which is the swapping of life stories with actors. And I realized that this is a personal film for you. Did you have to talk about your grandmother a lot with everyone? Yeah, yeah. I think that comes... Um, probably just naturally because that's my what my personal way into the story so um yeah I think that uh it's it's like a necessity <laughs> it would be hard it would be hard not to because it's it's so tied in with why I wrote the film in the first place it's just interesting I feel like a lot of directors they get to kind of put up these walls and then kind uh, of like sit aside and watch watch the performances and then judge them and demand or whatever um but it sounds right, like you had yeah. to give a lot to yourself a lot of yourself too yeah, and I, I feel like you try and, I, personally, I feel like you have to be vulnerable with them because they are being so vulnerable for you and to you as well. And I don't think you can have that sort of openness um, go one way and not the other. Personally, I don't know. Maybe, maybe other people <laughs> can put up walls, but I just feel like it's such a, that's such a much more like prescriptive way to work, maybe. Um, whereas I'm more interested in like, the mutual kind of empathy and connecting on that level and um, that influencing what they kind of put out on screen. All right, so final five questions. I think we have to get to it now. I'm sure we could ask many, many more questions, but uh, I'll go first. What's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about that film now? <laughs> how, what, what counts as a film? Anything, like... short film, whatever, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, the first like proper film I made was in high school. I, it was called The Reverie. <laughs> it's looking back now, it is pretentious as hell. Very like well intentioned. I appreciate all the ideas in it, but man, like no one will ever watch that film. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, what's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? Uh, something to the effect of like make sure you're climbing the right ladder. 
Um, leaving film school, I thought I would, you know, become an AD to just like pay rent. But then my lecturer kind of said to me, do you still want to be a director? Um, and if you do, you should direct. And so um, making sure that you're still creating things if you want to be a director. And do you have a goal as a filmmaker? Yeah, I mean, just to uh, keep working on, you know, stories that have something to say and are really like deeply personal and that I'm really passionate about. I think if I can make that a sustainable career, that would be my goal. <laughs> yeah. As a guilty pleasure, I would love to do like an epic one day. I think that would be Ooh. pretty cool. <laughs> if you could go back in time, what's the piece of advice you would give yourself? Probably something along the lines of um, uh, always look at like what comes out of like the successes that come out of your failures, I think, because you do have to go through so much rejection in this industry and, you know, that can really get you down and um you just have to see each kind of seemingly step backwards as you know a, 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 i guess a, an opportunity and then lastly is making movies hard <laughs> fuck yeah <laughs> yeah it's pretty hard hey um it's hard it's also like the the tenacity required to get to the point of even making the film is hard as well so I would say in general, it's hard, <laughs> yeah. but such a joy as well, right? <laughs> um, so where can people find you and um, where can they check out Relic? Oh, um, I don't have Twitter or anything, but I'm on Instagram at Natalie E. James and Relic is available to watch actually this weekend at drive-in theaters. So from July 3rd, okay. which is exciting. And then on VOD from July 10th. Amazing. Thank awesome. You. Right. Thanks so <laughs> Thanks, much. Guys. This has been fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for listening and thanks to Natalie for being on the show. And big thanks to Kate McEdwards from IFC for making this interview happen. And Relic is out now. So go to all your VOD streaming platforms, find the movie. If you're lucky enough to be near uh, a drive in, go see it in a drive in. Uh, I actually. <laughs> I saw like an hour of this movie and then my link expired because I ran out of time before the interview and I was gonna finish it and now I can't. So I'm gonna rent it because it was really, really good. And I'm gonna force my uh, wife to watch it with me because um, you know, she doesn't always like horror movies and but this is a really good one and it's not that scary. I mean, it is creepy all the way through and there are some scary moments, but I think she can handle it. Uh, you can check out our website at makingmoviesishard.com where you can find the links to the things we talked about in this episode. If you want to get in contact with us, you can send an email to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at MMIH Podcast. I am Ulrich B on Twitter and Instagram and Liz. I now have an Instagram, uh, Liz Manischel Film on Instagram and and Liz Manischel on Twitter. And please, if you like the show, tell a friend, spread the word. Uh, you can also leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or comment on Spotify. Those are all great things. And finally, thanks to our producers, Greg Holdsman and Joshua Sterling Bragg, editor Allison Stoney, and the whole Bloodstream Media team for making this episode possible. And we will talk to you guys next week. <laughs>